Good morning, this is Crystal Woods with Seasons in the Vine and it's Fresh Friday and I hope you are ready to dive into what salvation really means, how we can really see the evidence of it. Uh, Jesus tells us in John 15 that we need to abide in him and we will bear much fruit and we will actually prove to be his disciples. That's verse eight in chapter 15 of John. And so we can't just think that a prayer makes it one and done unless that person truly did regenerate. And we really won't know that from that one and done prayer. We really will know it as we see them living out their life. We have to see the fruit. We have to see discipleship because Christianity doesn't make converts, it makes disciples. And so I have some scriptures we're gonna pick up with. Um, there's other ways that we can measure discipleship. A new commandment I give to you, this is John 13, 34, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another, verse 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. Another word for disciples is followers. If you love, if you have love for one another. So there are marks of a disciple. There's evidence, there's fruit of the true regenerated person. And that's what we need to look for. And that's where the sinner's prayer can be an effective tool in, in speaking the gospel and leading someone in that surrender. But it doesn't end there <laughs> for that person and also for us because we are making a disciple. We're coming alongside and teaching. Um, actually, speaking about teaching, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also, who will be able to teach others also. So this is the mark of a disciple. This is also the mark of elders and pastors and different people in the church. But we need, to, if we're making disciples who make disciples, then teaching is going to be something that's important for all of us. And so last week I talked about how that was part one, and we were going to study the parable of the sower. We're going to look at what it really means to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And we're gonna look at what those words mean in the Greek because they mean something different than maybe you've been taught. Maybe you've understood it to be. Maybe even how you've led other people to Jesus. Um, I've heard it said, you know, throughout the years, just like, oh, it's just so easy. You just, you just believe and you just confess. And there's a lot of people that will head knowledge say, well, I know Jesus is the Son of God. I, I believe that God raised him from the dead. I, he, he's the Lord, but there's no evidence of that. That's a cognitive thing, and we're talking about a heart thing. And so we have to understand what the New Testament writers were really giving us in that word believe. So we're going to look at that. Um, let me see, scripture-wise... Oh, another mark of a disciple, Galatians 5, 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So we should see continued crucifying of the flesh. Like that is dead and I am moving forward in a way of freedom. So believing in your heart, what does that even mean? All right, so let's take a look at the word believe. And this is from Romans 10. Let me pull this up. This one particular passage we use really a lot. And that's totally fine. Romans has all of salvation, how to get saved, how to understand everything right in the actual letter, which is amazing. So in Romans 10, here we go. Verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. It's like, it's right there. Do you see that? And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Okay, so let's talk about that. So the word believe is the word pistevo in Greek. And this word is, when we think of believe, we think of a cognitive reality. Like I can just believe it in my head, this, the sky is blue and it just is. 
and we can just believe things here, but that's not actually what it means. So in the Greek, the word pistevo is really faithing, but we don't have a word in English that says faithing, like the action of faith, because it is actionable, it's measurable. Salvation is measurable. If you are saved, your life after that regeneration is measurable. People can look at it and observe and see the fruit of what has occurred spiritually. And so when you see the word believe now in the New Testament, it's everywhere. John uses it. Uh, Mark uses it. We have Paul here in Romans using it. We see it everywhere. Like John 3, 16, that word believe there, that's pistevo. So it's all over the place. It's the word for salvation. And it means to trust, putting your trust on something. Like I'm le like you would on a chair that was going to hold you up. So that, that looks like something. It's actionable. Do you trust the Lord like that? risking for him. If he asks you to do this, would you risk? Would you risk your livelihood? Would you risk your security? Would you risk your job? Would you risk your life if, if suddenly Christianity in America became illegal? Like that is what is required. That's what we see these New Testament authors bringing to us over and over again is this, when you follow Jesus, it's gotta be to the end and it could very well cost you your life. So it's a risk that you are willing to take. It is trust that on Jesus, that he is who he says he is and you're going to trust on him. And it's commitment. It's a severe commitment. So as committed as you would be to a mother or a father or your children, you're to be more committed to Christ, which we looked at some scriptures that talked about that last week. So that's the word pistevo. So believe in your heart. That is actionable. That's not up here at all which is why I always say salvation needs to look like something. And that's why when we go back to the sinner's prayer, if we're starting at that point, then we need to see that it actually has occurred in the heart. Does Jesus live in your heart? That's the question, right? So do you believe in your heart? Are you trusting, risking, and committed, committed to Christ? Trusting on, risking for, and committed to Christ. That's probably better language. Okay, so then the next one is, um, hold on. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So this word confess, um, I have it here. I printed it out in the Greek, homologio. If you wanna say it that way, I don't know how to say it in Greek, but that's the word. It is to profess, to declare openly, speak freely, to profess oneself the worshiper of another one, of another or of one, that would be Jesus, or to praise and celebrate. So this is a declaration. This is outward. It's got to be public. This isn't, I believe in Jesus, I confess that he's Lord, and no one around me knows. That's not salvation. Everyone around you would know. They would be able to see that you actually have real faith in Jesus because you declare openly and you speak out freely that he is the Lord, that God has raised him from the dead. We're going to get into that. To profess oneself as a worshiper of him. That is the confessing with your mouth. So it isn't a one and done, Jesus, I believe you're my Lord. This is an everyday actionable thing where he is my Lord day in and day out. That doesn't mean I follow perfectly. That doesn't mean, because perfect only goes to Jesus, folks. So I never am going to preach perfect or perfection because that's Jesus's job. But it, I do preach consistently. It should look like something. And it can't just be your actions. It, it, can, it also has to be the words that are coming out of your mouth. This declaration, speaking out freely of who Jesus is. So let's take a peek once again at that verse. Now that we've broken it down in the Greek. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. I mean, just such good doctrine there, which we cannot get into in, in great honoring context and, and extent today. But that is the two words I wanted you to get, confess and believe, okay? Now, this whole thing that God raised him from the dead, why is that so important? Why is it so important that God raised him from the dead? Well, because we believe in a bodily resurrection of Jesus. This is huge, and, and you, you, know, you have to take this seriously. 
This is something I learned. It's part of my statement of faith. Like there are people that don't believe Jesus bodily resurrected, but it has to be a bodily resurrection in order for us to be able to be resurrected at the end of the age, for us to be given new life, to go from death to life, to prove who he was. That's, that's why it's so important. Bodily resurrection is when Jesus' deity is proven. Like everything he has spoken has been confirmed by coming back to life. It's amazing. Everything he has said about himself and everything else, meaning the parable of the sower too, which we're going to look at as we end this message. Everything he said is true, and that's proven in the bodily resurrection. So I'm going to give you a little crash course on some, I mean, like this big of an apologetics. This big, little, little. Um, but this is really good because you. this is why you have to know that it's bodily and you have to articulate it that way because there are other theories about this that people believe and they're, they're not true. And there's lots of scriptures to back this up. You've got to do your research, but I'm just going to open the can of worms for you and just give it to you like this and let you begin to understand it. But the swoon theory is one where, where Jesus wasn't really dead. Um, he was just, it just seemed like he was dead but he wasn't really dead. And once he was in the tomb, instead of you know, that starting to decompose the cold, damp tomb or that, that tomb setting, whatever it would be, revived him and he just came back. <laughs> now, how we deal with that and the, the clothes being left there and, and all of that and obviously the things that he said afterwards and the fact his body is different because it's a glorified body so it's it's his resurrected body it's totally different it can go through things but also can be touched he can eat um, he can be hugged he can cook he can move things around but he can also go through locked doors so swoon theory he didn't really die he was just in a, like a passed out unconscious state by the way, these people were expert executioners. They knew how to kill someone, so not really likely, but people believe it. That's why we believe in a bodily resurrection. Unknown tomb. They didn't know where the tomb was, therefore his body could still be there. Now, we know where the, they, the Romans had guards there, so we know they know where the tomb was. We know that the women observed where they laid Jesus' body, and Joseph of Arimathea also would have known where his tomb was. But these are things people believe. These are things that people come at Christianity with. So you need to know them too. Hallucination theory. All of the many, 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 many times that he was seen, over 500 times, I believe it says in scripture, over those 40 days, he was seen and it was all a hallucination. It just wasn't even real. Um, everybody was hallucinating. They were whatever you want to say. But making it up or having some kind of spiritual encounter, but it wasn't really a bodily resurrection. Not true, because scripture tells us different. Impersonation theory. Now, this is comes from where people didn't really recognize him when they first saw him. Mary Magdalene is one. The men on the road to Emmaus is another. So they didn't really know who he was, so maybe he looked so different that really it wasn't him and somebody was impersonating him. But we know that is also not true. But that's why it has to be a bodily resurrection of the Jesus that was on the cross, the Son of God, God-man, the, the God incarnate in flesh died and that body that died came out of the grave. Has to be bodily. Okay, so that's the impersonation theory. Last one is a spiritual resurrection theory. It was just spiritual. The body is still there somewhere. Nobody ever really found it, but it was just a spiritual thing. That doesn't work though because it doesn't carry us through the end of the age. It doesn't, it's not what resurrection means anyway, but this is things that people will believe. But it was not a spiritual resurrection only. It was a body that came out that could be touched, that could eat, that could be hugged. He even tells Mary, like, you can't cling to me right now, right? Okay, so why is it important that it's a bodily resurrection? Well, let's look at our, our friend, the Apostle Paul, and we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15, and I have to make my way over there, so give me one second, because I have my Bible open to like many, many things. Okay, so we're going to read 1 through 22 real quick. I probably won't need to really break it down because it's pretty self-explanatory, but why does it have to be bodily? Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. It's not a one and done. It's an everyday thing. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Okay, guys, 
what I'm talking about is right there. It's right there. Do you see that? If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, that's that seed, the parable of the sower, um, unless you believed in vain, maybe you didn't really believe. And that's why we're seeing what's going on right now, whatever's happening here in Corinthians, in Corinth, I should say. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Okay, there's that 500. Most of them who are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Just another word for um, being dead. Oh, look at all this nice natural light coming in. Then he appeared to James. Okay, so you have the 500 accounts even at one time. 500 people saw him. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now we know that was a different kind of appearance. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Isn't that awesome? Identity and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now that word believed, important. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? He's correcting them that this end of the age, resurrection of the dead, it's going to happen. But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Like if it's not possible to have a bodily resurrection, then it didn't even happen for Jesus. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. For are we even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. So you can see he's kind of giving them some argument here. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. I'm in 17 now. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. If we don't hold to the bodily resurrection of Jesus, then death and sin are not defeated. There is no new life. There's no new nature, no new heart, no new name, no new identity. None of that. That's a big deal. That's why I will, I will fight on a hill about the bodily resurrection of Jesus. You better believe it. I will die on a hill for that. Then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we in Christ have hope in this life only, we are all, we are of all people most to be pitied. 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And it goes on. But do you understand? Really important. Bodily resurrection. I talked about the bodily resurrection the very first. I said I, would get, I was going to get to it. The very first false gospel message. Well, we got to it today. Okay, so now let's jump over to the parable of the sower. Hopefully you're keeping track. And you're understanding that the sinner's prayer could be a place to start. But we can't just assume that person is saved. It's not a one and done thing. Not only is Paul saying maybe you believed in vain, like maybe there wasn't a regeneration thing happening in that moment, but it was just more of an emotional thing or more of a feeling thing or more, maybe you believed as much as you understood at the time, but it wasn't enough to actually stick. Now let's talk about that. This is crazy. Let me just make sure. I think this is good. Okay, so let's look at the parable of the sower. We're going to be in Matthew 13. That same day Jesus went out of the house and he sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they didn't have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. Then they're asking him some things about parables. And then we're going to jump back down to verse 18, same chapter, to hear Jesus explain what it means. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word, so what is the seed? 
What's being, what's being sown? What are we doing? What's the gospel? So they hear the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it. It's not, it's not coming through. There's a block. There's something going on. When that happens, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. So that means that word was sown in his heart. It was planted there, but the evil one took it. Wow. Whew. Okay, this was, the, this was what was sown along the path, verse 20. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. This is a happy day. Oh my gosh, I believe this. Yes, yes, absolutely, I have joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on the account of the word, immediately he falls away. So the word is he begins to be persecuted for believing in Christ and decides, you know what, this isn't for me. I received it, but I'm rejecting it now. What does that mean? This, these are some of the passages where people debate then on like, can you lose your salvation or was that person even saved? These are things you have to work out with fear and trembling with the Lord and figure out where you fall in those lines. But this is a person who has received it and has endured for a while. But remember, there's that thing about the perseverance of the saints, enduring to the end. That's what we see in scripture over and over and over again. So as soon as he gets to be having a hard time about following Jesus, persecution, tribulation, just things come up, he falls away. 22, as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but cares, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and proves unfruitful. And as for unfruitful, so it proves unfruitful. So I want you to think about when you're giving the gospel out, you're the parable, this is the parable of the sower, you're the sower. And you're praying, you're doing the sinner's prayer with someone and you're leading them. There are four options here with how this is going to go. That's what we need to start understanding. That's why I'm not a fan of the ticker tape or like this many people came down today and got saved, you know, whatever. Well, no, because maybe they received it with joy, but they're not going to stay. That's why we can't be one and done. It's not one and done. We have to stay in the game and really begin to see the fruit. Mm, when I get to false teachers, which might be as early as next week, I'm feeling like we might be pretty wrapped up with false gospels for now. Hey, I can always do something else as the Lord leads me and bring it back around. Um, but there's something about false teachers or prophets or apostles or people that are just sheep in wolves clothing or wolves in sheep's clothing. They rise really quick. They can exemplify lots of spiritual things, but there's no real fruit there. Whew, that's another thing. All right, anyway, they, it proves unfruitful. 23, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and another 30. So that's what I want you to understand. The hard heart is the first seed that falls on the roadside. This represents people who hear the word of God but never really believe. The heart is so hard. Who We know Satan likes to keep people's hearts hard as well. Then there is the shallow heart. This is the seed that falls on stony ground. It signifies people who hear the word of God and receive it with joy. Like they're glad to hear it. They're happy to hear the gospel. But because there's no root to sustain them, they wither. This is where discipleship comes along. We're not making a convert, a one and done thing. We're actually helping people get root systems. This, I'm a huge proponent of discipleship. I actually do a lot of discipleship. I sit down and meet with people and we learn what it means to follow Jesus. This is paramount, it's huge. Because when they begin to come under certain things, tribulation, persecution, they'll fall away if they don't have that root system. You're being saved. That's what, I mean, Paul said it. So you guys gotta look at what that, what that would mean, but it means more than a one and done. Next, there is the crowded heart. That is the seed that falls on the ground where weeds choke out, um, it's growth, it's slowly and surely, these people are busy with things of the world. The world has captured them and they just lose interest in God. But it looked like they were with us for a time, but then they just kind of fell off too. And then there's the fruitful heart. This is the good soil, it's planted, they become a disciple of Jesus, they follow him all the days of their life, not perfectly, but they are truly devoted to the Lord. He is Lord and Savior. The, there's, it's actionable trust, risk, and commitment. The word pistevo, and they are open about their faith. It's not a secret. They're not closet Christians. I don't, I don't even think that's possible. 
There's no such thing as closet Christianity in the Bible. It's not possible. You can't be a secret Christian. So I guess I'll leave you with that. I, I just literally downloaded probably hours worth of information. Marinate in it. Let the Lord bring it all together. But the word believe means something way deeper than up here. It's a down here thing. Confess is public. And then the parable of the sower. When we are preaching the gospel, there are four options. Even when we might see, we might see someone totally rejected. That would be the first one. But the other ones, we might really see like, wow, we think this person has really come to the Lord. But only time will tell. We got to look at the fruit. Don't put people in leadership that don't have fruit for like long periods of time. Don't be so quick to do that. I've done that and I'll share that when I get to being like a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. I've seen that and it was very damaging to me and my family to put faith in something that was not tested over time. You are being saved every day. All right, much love. Bear that fruit, friends. If you have any questions, let me know and I'll see you next week.